question for you. What is the best food you ever tasted? Where were you? Who were you with? What were you doing? While you think about that, I'm going to tell you a story. My story starts here on a hobby farm where I grew up. This is me, some of my siblings, and my dad. Growing up, we celebrated food often, every day, in fact. And we grew food, we grew vegetables, and we picked them. And for the vegetables we couldn't eat, my mom froze them or she preserved them. We used to joke, if you stood still long enough, she might throw you into a mason jar. <laughs> food is vital for physical existence. We all know this. But I believe it's also vital for emotional and spiritual well-being. We do not have the connection to food that we should. And I think we need to change this. My connection to food is very strong. This connection led me to study food science at Acadia and later at Guelph. After university, I worked in the food industry for many years. I have seen processing plants all over the world. I've worked on foods from uh, Crunch and Munch to Campbell's Soup to granola bars. And I want to talk just a little bit more about commercial granola bars. This slide shows you all of the ingredients in a common chewy granola bar. I know it's hard to read, but there's 38 ingredients there. You'll see that the ingredients in red are the main components. The yellow are the ingredients that make up those components, and the green is because some components also have components. So to make this a little bit more simple, I made a picture. Uh, you start with making crisp rice. So crisp rice is made of rice flour and three other ingredients. Those are mixed together, put in a package, and shipped to a second facility. Then you have to also make the chocolate chips. Chocolate chips are made with sugar and four other ingredients, put in a package, shipped to a facility. Brown rice crisps are made with whole grain brown rice and three other ingredients. So then you take all of those subcomponents and mix with the granola, and that makes your granola bar. The granola bar is then processed, cut, put in those little foil packages you would recognize, put in a box with five or ten other granola bars, put in a bigger box, put on a pallet wrapped in plastic, shipped to a distribution center. At the distribution center, it's broken down, repacked based on a retail order, and shipped to a grocery store. At the grocery store, it's unpacked again, put on the grocery store shelf, and that's where you would see it, pick it up, put it in your cart, and take it home. Alternatively, at my house, we make granola bars every Sunday. There are 11 ingredients. Uh, truthfully, there's usually only seven, but to make it fair, I put the chocolate chips in these ones. Um, if you want to make these granola bars, what you do is take the rolled out sunflower seeds, almonds, and coconut, put it in a bowl, give yourself some space. Then you take the butter and the honey, put it in a pot on the stove, melt it, pour that over the other stuff, mix it up, put it on a pan, stick it in the oven, 325, 15 minutes, take it out, put the chocolate chips on top, cut it, and you can keep those for about, in my house, a week. Um, so why do I tell you this story? Because I told you I love food, and I was connected to food, and I went and I studied food science, and I thought, we're going to make food better. But I started realizing we're not making food better. We're making food faster, easier, convenient, cheap, and most importantly, always exactly the same. So many meetings I sat in, we don't want it to be better, we just want it to be the same. Make it the same as last time. Why? Because that's what the consumer wants. Well, who's the consumer? Oh, that's you and me. And we're busy, we're busy, we're, we're on the go, we need our food fast. We need to eat, we need to get the kids where they need to go, and, and we just need our food to fit into our life. But wait a minute, if food is just fitting into our life, what happened to that connection? What happened to that value where food was part of our life? The meal, tasting food, sharing food. What happens to that if food's just fitting in between the soccer game and school? So, did the food industry create this eat and run culture? Or did they just respond to the consumer? Now, this is not an uncommon marketing question, but it really made me think about a book that I love by Dr. Zeus. 
called the Lorax. Maybe you've read it. And I'm just wondering, is the processed food just a need, a need that everyone, everyone, everyone needs? And is the food industry just biggering and biggering and biggering? And we're buying into it in the millions. So somewhere along the line, on top of fast, easy, cheap, we thought, uh-oh, we're not very healthy anymore. Can we add some health in there? So literally, we're like, how do we add health to the bar that we're selling? So we start taking tomato, and you take the lycopene out of the tomato, and you put it in the bar, and then everybody's healthy, right? Or not? That's another debate. And believe me, there's many hours of debates about these things. Is it right to add nutrients back to the food, or should we just eat the whole food? Well, these debates led to more debates. And now today, food is a very complicated thing. And this is just my wordle of some of the words that came to my mind as a stream of consciousness of what matters about food. And these words are being talked about in marketing meetings, in innovation meetings, all over the world at these big food companies. Actually, starting tomorrow is one of the biggest food conferences happening in New Orleans. And they'll be talking about all these things because that's what you want. You want these things. You want local, you want sustainable, you want green. And they want you to be happy, so you'll buy their product. So they're thinking about these things. Now, I have something to say about those big companies. They have a lot of power, and they can spread an idea really fast. So before we jump to thinking that they're the problem, and they're the devil, and they're the evil, we should think, maybe they can help us. Maybe they're an ally. They are doing good things, I guarantee you. Some of these companies are doing amazing projects in different communities around the world. So I just want you to think that maybe, maybe they could be an ally. Because this isn't a simple situation. Connecting people back to food is not easy or simple. But I actually think that it's millions of simple things. And if we string them together, they'll reach around the world and back. Now, I have another question for you to think about. Where did you spend your last dollar on food? In Nova Scotia, every dollar spent on food, 87 cents leaves our province. That leaves 13 cents here. So that probably means we're not growing very much food here. And that's true. The red line here shows a number of farms in Nova Scotia between 1920 and 2010. Basically, there just aren't very many. Let's look at strawberries and pears. The top line here is strawberries, and the bottom is pear. So this shows our self-reliance. How many of the strawberries that you're eating are actually grown in Nova Scotia? We've had up to 150% grown here. So we could export some and we could all enjoy some. Today, 40%. 40% of the strawberries sold here were grown here. Pork. I could do a whole day's worth of talk on pork in Nova Scotia. But I think the picture speaks better than I could. There's just no pork grown here anymore. So unless you're buying it directly from a farmer, your pork is not being raised in Nova Scotia. So if this concerns you, if your dollar didn't go to a local producer, but you think maybe, maybe your next dollar should, I want to tell you some of the benefits. I'll use beef as an example. 2% of our local food dollar goes towards red meat, and 90 to 90% of the beef in this province is imported. So, what about the economics? We all know we're in an economic situation. We need more jobs, we need more revenues. We could quadruple farm revenues if we grew our beef here, and we could triple farm jobs. What about the environment? Well, this truck has to carry everything that comes here, along with often some ships and airplanes, too. So if we bought food that was grown here, we could reduce emissions. We could also improve soil quality, for obvious reasons, and use underutilized, underutilized farmlands. Personal health. If you know where your food comes from, you will know if it was grown with pesticides. You will know if antibiotics were fed to that, farm, to that animal, because you'll know your farmer. You can trace your food back to where it was grown. You can shift your diet to the amazing variety available locally here. You have a diversity of products, and in my opinion, your food will taste a lot better. Now, possibly the most driving reason for me to buy local is the future of our communities and our families. Right now, there is no future for farmers if we keep going the way we're going. But, we have land, and we have the possibility 
of making farming a viable option. We have the opportunity to celebrate food, to create jobs, to maintain rural infrastructure, and to create a mutual reliance, to have food sovereignty, meaning, what if we were cut off from the rest of the world and we couldn't get all this food that we're getting imported now? Then what would we do? We wouldn't have enough farms to grow our food. But we could. And how can we do it? We can do it by making a choice and by being responsible. If we spend our money in the province, it will stay in the province. It'll be spent in the province, and it will benefit all of us. If we don't spend our money in the province, it will go elsewhere. So, if you didn't spend your last dollar on a local product, maybe your next dollar should be. However, I'm not going to stand here and tell you I only eat things that are grown in Nova Scotia. It would just be a lie. So, there are other opportunities to um, to get products from other places besides Nova Scotia. But first of all, how do you get products if you want something grown here? How do you get it? You get it. You can get it direct from the farmer. You can. I have meat delivered right to my door. No problem at all. It doesn't even cost me extra. It's cheaper sometimes than the price in the grocery store. You can join a community shared agriculture. I have a fruit and vegetable ag community shared agriculture box. Every Tuesday, I pick it up. It's about two blocks from my house. It's a tremendous value. And I just decide what I'm going to make after I get the box. You can go to a farmer's market. There's one in almost every town and city in Nova Scotia. You can go to a locally owned store. Even in a store that's locally owned, if the product's not from Nova Scotia, you know the owner is making the money and using it again in our own province. You can grow a garden. And if that's too daunting, go to someone else's. Gardeners always have extra food. Now, what about oranges, coffee, chocolate? I have coffee every day, but I make sure it's fair trade. You should learn about fair trade. If you buy a fair trade product, even if your money goes to the far-flung corners of the world, you'll know that the farmers there were treated fairly, that they have an opportunity to have access to credit, to make their own community better and have choices. It's not about charity. It's about having more of your dollar go to the person who grew your food. So for example, coffee. The top graph shows conventionally traded coffee. More than half of your dollar goes to the coffee company and only 11 cents to the farmer. But if you buy a fair trade coffee, 28 cents goes to the farmer, almost triple. And the price, I will tell you this too, in case you don't know, a cup of coffee at a coffee shop, fair trade in this city, doesn't cost you more than a regular cup of coffee from a non-fair trade. True enough, a bag of coffee will cost you a little more, but I guarantee you it's worth it. If you can't find the product locally, and you can't buy it fair trade, and you want to buy it from a large big box store, that's fine. But please realize your influence. Please ask questions. That retailer will answer your questions, but you have to ask. We've already gone over that the consumer is king. Everybody wants to please you, but you need to use your voice. So first, use your voice, and second, use your dollars. I have one last thing to share with you, and that's about waste. We all have an obligation to not waste our food. There are far too many people with not enough food for us to be wasting like we do. So please buy what you need, eat what you need, and don't buy extra. Don't throw it in the compost, and for goodness sake, don't throw it in the garbage. 25% of all the food created in Canada is, is wasted. It never gets eaten by anyone. So wherever you choose to buy your food, just make sure you eat it. Now, do you remember my very first question? What was the best food you ever tasted? To me, the best food you ever tasted is about everything I talked about. It's about communities. It's about families. It's about people connecting. It's about where you were and what you ate. So I'll tell you my story. The best food I ever tasted happened on a strawberry you pick field. Now, every year, my family goes in a large group, and we pick strawberries, lots and lots of strawberries. It was a hot day the kind of hot that we hardly ever get, where you have like the waves of heat over the field, and we were tired. But as we were getting ready to go, I saw this perfect, perfect, perfect berry sitting on top of the greens, and I just had to pick it and eat it, even though you're supposed to put it in the box and pay for it. And, and when I put it in my mouth, it was like warm and firm and not mushy and perfect, perfect, fresh, Nova Scotia-grown strawberry. And that was the best food I ever tasted. Thank you.